Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those who have missed the first session, my name is René van Yerden. I'm the Cybersecurity Manager of Sandring. Um, the SAN RIN, of, of which goal is to provide internet and bandwidth and extra services like EDGERO for the, all the educational, higher educational centers and science schools in South Africa. Um, so we're part of, of NICIS. Um, with our external partner, Tene, that provide the internet. They're not Nikis, but we are sending a part of Nikis. And part of this conference with the overall uh, theme of, of, the, of the Internet of Things, we have the following um, presenter, Dr. Bert van Niekerk from the University of Kozulu Natal. Uh, Dr. Bert van Niekerk is a senior lecturer at the at University of Kozulu Natal and serves as chair of the International Federation of Information Processing Working Group on the ICT of Peace and War, and is a co-editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Cyber Warfare and Terrorism. He has numerous years of information and cybersecurity experience, both in academia and industry, and he's continued to the ISO IEC Information Security Standards and his international working groups. He has over 70 publications and presentations to his name. And in 2012, he graduated with a PhD focusing on information info operations and critical infrastructure protection. He also holds an MSc in electronic engineering and is a CISM certified. Um, so over to you, Dr. Uh, Red Van Niekerk. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking around Internet of Things in relation to information warfare. Um, and I will explain the, the, the linkages, uh, why I'm looking at information warfare and not uh, pure security in a bit. So obviously, Internet of Things, I'm, I'm sure you all know, um, it, it's a hyper-connected systems of, of interrelated uh, computing devices, um, with a lot of uh, cyber physical connections, um, each device having uh, some unique identifiers. Um, you don't necessarily need human to human uh, or, or human to human interaction, um, but quite often uh, that is present uh, within some of the devices. So if we just look at a, a generic IoT architecture within a um, standard network, I mean, you'd obviously have your IoT devices with uh, associated protocols, uh, some form of data connectivity, are going up to things like your, your cloud management platforms, um, as well as then obviously the, the, the user end uh, portals and so on. So we can consider the IoT devices as part of the sensing layer. Uh, you have your network layer, obviously connecting the IoT devices to your normal uh, networks, uh, as well as um, wide area networks. Um, your data processing, again, quite often that would, we would be looking at things like your big data uh, and, and cloud being involved here. Um, and then obviously your smart application layers. So the user end, the applications and the portals um, for all the reporting. And just for completeness at, at the top, I also added social media. Um, obviously, if you start taking uh, smart devices, uh, TVs and so on can connect to, to social media uh, in, in addition to your smart uh, phones. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, data uh, also being generated through that. So obviously the IoT has a number of implications. So you're increasing your network size, um, particularly in terms of adding more endpoint devices and, and quite a number of those devices are not in traditionally something that would be networked um, as well as obviously some of them might be ad hoc. So if you're looking at um, something like say a, a smart port or a smart mine, uh, you might be using IoT for predictive analytics um, on vehicles or equipment that's moving around. Um, so again, that, that does add uh, additional um, complications uh, in terms of the network size. Um, then obviously also it will increase network traffic because you now have all of these devices communicating um, ac across the network. But we're also seeing that reemergence of protocols. Um, so on the previous slide, there was like Zigbee, uh, MQTT, those types of protocols are, are making a comeback because they're now lightweight, the ad hoc uh, in terms of Zigbee, uh, w which kind of um, sort of uh, works quite well with the, the IoT concept. Um, then obviously with the data processing, um, not only is there the cloud and the big data, you now have the emergence of edge computing and as well as fog computing. Um, so depending on where you want to actually sit uh, the computing or the bulk of, of the computing power, um, and in some cases it makes sense moving it more towards uh, the edge closer to the sensors, 
in some instances, it makes more sense, obviously, having it close to the user um, where you have a lot more data. So, for instance, initial processing, pre processing can be done closer to the center, um, and then obviously, aggregation of, of large quantities uh, across thousands or millions of devices you, you would probably do uh, in the cloud. And obviously, um, the, the, the one major implication, which will be the focus, is the security aspect um, of the IoT. So I'm just going to jump off into information warfare because some of these terms will impact on, on a few other slides. So I did a few last minutes reshuffling on the slides now. Now, obviously, from the security aspect, we'll think, you know, the cyber security, uh, which is, is fairly common. Um, but then if you look at the broader information warfare, what we used to call psychological operations, more from like a, a military perspective, we're now getting this disinformation, fake news, mis um, dis sorry, misinformation, uh, things like the election interference, uh, all those types of things coming through. Um, obviously, since 2016, it's been uh, quite prevalent in the media. In addition, you have electronic warfare. So that is more for the engineers, things like your uh, jamming of radar and communications and trying to protect radar and communications from, from jams or your anti-jam technologies uh, and so on. Then we get some other aspects with more enabling type of um, concepts like network centric warfare. So that concept is now you've actually connected a number of in the military war fighting um, platforms onto a single network so they can share things like detections, uh, fire control, all those types of things. Very um, predominant in, in things like the Navy, like say American carrier battle group, uh, where you can then network all the ships in, in, in the uh, in the battle group together and still connect to things like your uh, electronic warfare aircraft um, with, with the early warning and so on. In addition to that, you have your command and control warfare. So the ability of people to make decisions. Um, so obviously the command is in the military, but if you apply that to a business sense, can your executives have get access to the relevant information that they need in time to be able to make um, adequate decisions uh, around the business? And then your intelligence aspects, obviously the analysis, being able to collect uh, information from uh, outside of your immediate environment uh, and so on, analyze it uh, and, and make uh, suggestions. So then back to the IoT, um, one of the, the common things, is it a revolution or is it an evolution? And I think it's actually a mixture of both depending on where you're really sitting. In your commercial IoT, generally it's gonna be a revolution. There's things there that we're never ever connected to a network. Your TVs, fridges, toasters, all those types of things. You get connected mousetrap. Um, so it's something that, that you normally would not have connected to the network are now connected. Um, and that's obviously really changing uh, things within that space. In your industrial networks, it's more of an evolution because you already had things like your SCADA systems, your control systems connected to be able to provide some form of remote control of machinery equipment in areas that generally you, it's not pleasant for a human to go. Um, so again, something like a mine or a chemical process, you didn't want to expose humans to that 24 seven, um, but then you wanted 24 seven uh, visibility. So you generally had those kinds of, of monitoring. And again, things like your, your safety systems with um, the, the industrial equipment, those again needed 24 seven uh, monitoring. Um, so generally all of that was already uh, connected to the network. We are just now adding more sensors, more uh, equipment to that to give better visibility or better control. Within your military context, it's a bit of a mixture. As we've mentioned, the network centric warfare, you already were connecting a number of uh, the platforms together anyway to be able to share information. Um, on the other side, you still have um, a revolution in terms of the things like smart bases. So like your, your building management systems being deployed uh, in, in a portable format to be able to, to manage uh, your forward operating bases and, and so on uh, where they're deployed. And if you take the medical aspect, again, your large devices like X-ray machines tended, you, you could have those connected. I mean, um, even quite a while ago, you know, your dentist uh, with, with some of their machines that they use were connected to, to computers. So um, it's more of an evolution. However, we're also getting things like your smart pacemakers, um, insulin pumps, and so on that can be uh, connected to Wi-Fi or, or other networks. So again, there is an aspect of a revolution here, 
where things that people would not normally have associated with networking are being connected. So moving on to the security concerns, um, and just a couple uh, cartoons or, or memes here. So the first one, did you know the S uh, in IoT is for security, saying there is no S in IoT. Um, so I think that that is one of the concerns that obviously there's a number of devices that can be connected to the network where security is taking uh, sort of a back seat. Um, and the other side, if you talk, start taking things like Alexa and uh, some of the smart home type systems, um, in the 1960s, there was this paranoia about uh, people being wiretapped by the government. Uh, whereas in the modern day, you, you're literally talking to, you put the wiretap in your house uh, and you'd ask it for a, a recipe or what the weather is and, and so on. So that whole shift of, of human thinking uh, around being concerned just about talking on the phone versus now you openly talk in front of devices that literally monitor every single thing that you say. Um, and just a few illustrations of security incidents. There have been cases of fridges uh, sending spam emails. Um, you've had smart TVs uh, vulnerabilities that, that could um, be used in, in certain attacks. And again, in, in some instances, they've actually had a um, manufacturer of smart TVs say, warning that you know we cannot guarantee um, that if you have a TV, a smart TV within a boardroom, that people could not be listening into to what is being discussed. Um, in the bottom left, the, the, just before elections, there tends to be spates of hacking of things like road signs, um, maybe you know, displays uh, within transportation systems for maybe I don't know, airline or train schedule, uh, putting up political messages or some other things. Um, so some examples of that. And then the big one that really put uh, IoT security on the map uh, with a Mirai botnet, and where there are a number of uh, attacks um, from that. So the, the, the first major one really was uh, the Lynn uh, service provider, which pretty much shut down social media across the Western Europe and, and the US, um, followed by one against Liberia, was against one of the telcos there, which essentially knocked Liberia off uh, the broader internet. Um, then again, things like your CCTV cameras, because Mirai Botnet ultimately was using CCTV cameras and, and related uh, systems. So if you could use that for a DDoS attack, what else can be seen um, you know, in, in terms of privacy and so on from security cameras? And it turns out they don't necessarily need to know the, the specific actual or gain access to the visuals of a security camera. If you look at the traffic, the way that they try and, and minimize traffic, um, as soon as you see a, a uptake in, in traffic, it means someone's moving around in a certain room or a certain area. So immediately they can tell if someone is home or not by um, looking at, at baseline traffic. So that there are implications for, for privacy and, and that uh, thing. And again, there's been a number of issues with things like nanny cams that, that are, are Im embedded in like teddy bears and so on, like the hidden cameras, where you had cloud access had actually very, very poor security. Um, then again, new things that in terms of, or in general, hackers trying to, to infiltrate network organizations through, uh, through IT. An example would be a casino was literally hacked through a fish tank uh, because they had a smart thermometer or, or something else monitoring the fish tank, um, and that was not secure. Um, and uh, obviously, the hackers managed to get in and migrate across the, the, the casino network. And the top right, I was leaving that for last, I mentioned things like automated operations. Uh, within mines or in ports, um, there's been actually quite a um, issue where signals have been jammed because a lot of that automated equipment, which is networked, requires GPS uh, for its positioning. So it needs to know where it is to be able to, to operate properly. And people have been jamming GPS, which then literally shuts down your equipment because it can't operate without that signal. Um, so that's just illustrating from uh, another perspective uh, some of the issues that you can have with connected equipment. Um, and then being standard in an academic uh, environment, um, a university has been attacked by its own IoT devices, primarily vending machines and light bulbs. Um, so that was around, I think over 5,000 devices. Um, again, it was insecure in that they did not change the default password. Um, so the hackers did them a favor and changed the password for them. Uh, so they could not actually recover those devices to, to, to try and uh, stop the DDoS attack. 
Um, so it took them quite a, quite a while to try and recover from that one. So it was essentially all those devices were targeting, uh, I think it was a DNS, um, which seriously affected the network services. So to summarize um, some of the things that we've been seeing and, and a few other information, uh, one of the reports indicated there was a 600% increase uh, in IoT attacks between 2016 and 2017. So that's quite a large jump uh, compared to if, if you look at things like even mobile malware and so on, uh, where people really were predicting a, a large increase and never really appeared. And um, so your insecure IoT, I, I've already mentioned the default or, or weak password. The other issue is you've got those unknown devices in your environment. They are the IoT devices that should be there, but because it's ad hoc, what else is being introduced? You might have well-meaning people trying to uh, fiddle and, and try and make some uh, nice new system uh, to, to benefit an organization, but they might be introducing new um, systems into the environment that's not secured properly um, and, and can be a backdoor. And one of the other issues is um, quite often you have projects for IoT uh, and they'll consider security for those IoT projects. The problem is in they're defining IoT in the boundary of that project. And they're not really thinking of the devices that are already in the environment. So for instance, if you want to maybe have um, put in, we'll just use smart vending machines uh, for a university as an example, but what about the smart TVs that are already in the lecture hall um, for maybe video conferencing between uh, various venues? Just because it is not within a, a dedicated IoT project doesn't mean it is not IoT. It is still there, it is still in the environment, and it can still be insecure. And um, we've mentioned that the denial of service attack. So that, that um, DIN attack uh, hit over a terabyte per second of raw data. So now just imagine if that started using something like a reflection attack or amplification attack, you could get quite significant um, attacks. And now more modern attacks, again, we are seeing quite uh, high data rates in, in terms of DDoS. Things like traffic capturing, IoT devices, a Raspberry Pi, Arduino, something like that, that have built in Bluetooth, LTE, um, Wi-Fi type of connections can be very useful if it can be smuggled into something like a server room uh, or something like that, um, or even onto a switch uh, for traffic capturing or, or to be an entry point into an organization's networks. Um, so you just need to plug it in um, and you can already dial in via the LTE uh, and, and gain access or backdoor access into an organization network. In addition, all those protocols that we mentioned, MQTT, Zigbee, and so on, again, security is a problem. Um, and again, dealing with an IoT uh, project with an industry, um, MQTT is, no, no, don't worry, it's secure, it's secure. Um, and then obviously about a week or so later, uh, news broke and of um, a number of security issues with MQTT or certain versions of it. Uh, and they had to go and relook at um, that project to make sure it was uh, secure enough. And some of the other aspects that are coming out which are more intriguing, but are, are not necessarily as prevalent in the media, but you can see them uh, maybe within some academic papers and, and so on. The concept of using things like drones or other mobile IoT devices for war driving. So instead of you know, the old war talking and, and so on, you actually use a drone and you fly it around a neighborhood to try and pick up um, insecure Wi-Fi. Um, in addition, there's been some research in actually using drones to deliver possible cyber attacks against Wi-Fi and so on, um, using swarming, uh, et cetera. Um, if we start taking a little bit further from that, uh, we mentioned that the hacking of media devices. So just imagine the impact you can have to uh, within maybe election interference or something like that, if you can take your social media uh, type this information, but also push it to things like your smart billboards um, within, within your commuting train stations, airports and so on, the roadside um, type of, uh, you know, the, those electronic displays, um, or even be able to hack the smart TVs in, in, a, in a store. You can then seriously start pushing out a lot of um, fake news, et cetera, onto those types of devices. Even if you're broadcasting using uh, a Zoom type of system, uh, if you can push it out on, onto those uh, systems somehow, you can actually significantly magnify uh, that type of uh, disinformation or cause panic based on, on people in, in the street. And quite often, 
also just as an irritant, people have hacked things like air, um, not air raid sirens, but your, your tornado warning systems, uh, very similar concepts uh, in the US. So middle of the night, these things are going off continuously. And, and it does cause a bit of a quandary for the people. Do they actually go take shelter? Uh, is, is there a tornado coming or you know, is it actually uh, just a, a, um, another incident? Um, in terms of wireless communications, because that is so prevalent in IoT, again, the issues of jamming, we, we mentioned the GPS, um, but also the use of software-defined radios now. What can you actually do with those things? Um, you literally can, depending on, on some of the hardware specifications, configure to do almost anything. So you can change that into some form of electronic warfare device to be able to try and overwrite, at least in a local area, um, some of the, the radio signals. Um, or obviously to be able to intercept certain things. So again, where you have a lot of IoT ad hoc moving around in an environment, the software device defined radios could be used um, to, to interfere with that. Um, and just example from, from the military perspective, uh, the F-35 has been called a flying server. Um, more formally, uh, they, they define it as a net enabling node in a system of systems. So ultimately, if you think what that aircraft will have in terms of weapon systems, radar, communications, and so on, it is also a node to be able to connect to all the other systems um, operating in, in that area. Um, and it says that it can go up to four by 10 to the 11 operations per second. So that has very serious computing power in a flying weapon, ultimately. So if you start taking that now to your military, your industrial, and your mining equipment, you now have mobile computers pretty much everywhere in, in the environment, where traditionally, normally, you wouldn't have much of a, a computing power because it's dirty and, and not really conducive to computers. But now, because of this concept of IoT, you're getting more hardy devices deployed in those types of environments, meaning your network needs to expand, meaning there's more entry points uh, in, into the organization. So some points on how to secure all of this. Um, obviously, you need to consider every single IoT device within the environment, whether it's part of an IoT project or not. So even a multifunction printer, scanner, fax device, what are you doing about security? What are you doing about security for your smart TVs? Uh, in addition to the things that you're putting in for predictive analytics uh, and, and so on. Um, the company dealing with some of the IoT when I was in the industry brought in a coffee machine where you could order coffee or hot chocolate or something from your computer and go and pick it up. Um, but you bring all those things into the environment, are they secure, what could go wrong? Um, obviously, change the default login credentials. Um, that is one of the key things uh, been driving most of the IoT attacks. And where possible, include multi-factor authentication. So if someone tries to log in to things like the administration of an IoT device, you need some form of alert or, or verification using um, the multi-factor authentication to try and prevent that. Especially you should be doing that on, on sensitive accounts uh, and, and some of your mobile phones anyway. Segregating the network is very important. Trying to keep certain types of devices away from your more sensitive um, data that might be stored within an enterprise network. Um, so if they are compromised, it doesn't impact on the overall network. Um, one of the things that we looked at when network access control was fairly useful, starting to do the scan so that obviously we started picking up like the Raspberry Pis and, and so on. That really should not have been on the network at that point. Um, but then again, network access control was a very useful way to be able to control um, the various devices, especially in a very mo uh, mobile type environment. Um, so using something like maybe a, pri a private LTE network, um, being able to control what devices can actually connect to that. Um, encryption where you can get it, um, as well as a secure gateway. So if you're using a cloud computing, um, as well as your IoT gateways as well, securing those, making sure um, if you can put it in a VPN uh, with encryption, uh, that, that the information that's being transferred is secure, but also it, it just limits the ability of someone to try and get into those uh, systems. Um, monitoring again, trying to extend that into the entire uh, the IoT environment. Um, sometimes that is, challenging. Um, I've got a student who has literally just submitted looking specifically at that uh, using an, uh, um, a, a dual stage uh, IDS device where you can actually offload some of the actual monitoring onto the IoT devices themselves. 
So they can do binary detection. Does it look malicious or not? If it is malicious, you can then pass it on to um, another gateway or, or something a little bit more powerful, which would then try and classify uh, the specific type of malicious activity. And in all of this, you need to worry about flexibility and scalability because you might bring in another IoT project, you might have another thousand or a million devices suddenly added onto the network. Can your security solutions scale to that? Um, so you need to try and pre-plan uh, the security to be, or future-proof it um, for, for future IoT projects as well. Uh, make sure it's flexible enough um, where if you need to remove some of the devices, you, your security can scale back uh, if you don't need it. Uh, and then obviously scale it up when, when there's more in the environment. Um, so to conclude, um, your, your IoT provides a, a very good mechanism for, for hyperconnected uh, cyber physical interaction within a number of uh, industry verticals, uh, but it obviously does introduce that security risk. Um, obviously you comp compromise IoT, but then there's also that increased reliance on IoT connections and so on, um, which then does one provide uh, multiple vectors to either interfere with operations by jamming it, um, or again, access point into the enterprise. And then again, you have to be wary of the intentional use um, of IoT in an environment for, for malicious purposes, via drones or, or uh, um, maybe a, a Raspberry Pi with, with a, a Kali Linux uh, embedded on it. Um, so that IoT can actually start um, enabling your, your information warfare functions. So if you start taking critical infrastructure, uh, into account maybe power stations, waterworks, and so on, that does become uh, very worrying where you can actually uh, potentially do a lot of damage to, to another country's uh, systems um, because of insecure connected devices. Um, so just to last point, um, it's very important again to reinforce that you need to weigh the risks of IoT against the benefits. Don't just do IoT because that is a catchphrase. Make sure you're doing it because you actually need it and start implementing security from the up. Thank you, that's all from my side. So I think we are open for questions now. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Fanika. It's what another fascinating talk and the impact on Nikis will be actually significant because um, as big institutions like universities and even like the Sounds Council, like the CSR, have produced um, IoT devices, that brings a total new vector of attack. Um, where, you, where you traditionally uh, um, have to scale, have to scale for X amount of devices, even the not of service attack. A quick question is. Um, has on a protocol level, as these devices, um, IP4, IP version 6, what's the most popular these days or because of the scale of the number of devices you're talking about? Um, I, um, in industry, the ones we, we came across were still IPv4. Um, I, I think with you know, the, the, the ability to do network translation and, and so on um, has allowed for that. Um, but again, a lot of the devices were, were using things like your um, private LTEs. So the, the protocol on that end was slightly different um, to the IoT gateway. And then you would translate into um, IPv4 from, from the um, mm -hmm. certain areas. Again, obviously, you can have IPv4 um, over, over the LTE as well. Um, so it, it really depends on what you are trying to implement uh, and the type of the devices. Um, so for, for low-scale sensors, you, you can probably uh, get away with a very light uh, protocol uh, with an IP stack. A quick you know. question. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have a lot of time before okay, the next sure. uh, uh, But this, this is actually probably a difficult one to answer shortly. Mm. It's a simple question from the audience. Um, with all the disadvantages, um, what is the main benefit of IoT? Why would we use IoT? Mm. So especially in industry applications, um, your, your ability for predictive analytics increases drastically. Um, so if, if you take something like, say, a, a crane, that, that crane is moving in multiple directions. You've got multiple moving parts. So you can actually measure how many moves each part has done and start predicting in advance of when is it going to need a service or when is it going to need something replaced 
or generally you, you might know average time for, for failure um, is even close to that period. So you might want spares, which means your supply chain for getting spares, ordering and so on is important. Knowing um, how to schedule your devices in terms of taking it out of production, um, adding another one into production. Thinking of, of like a mine or a port or something where, where you literally, you know, you, you're earning millions of rands per, per hour. Um, being able to manage your devices properly is, is really significant. Again, things like with the university, uh, your vending machines, your, your being able to load credit for, for the students on, on printers or anything like all those types of connected devices allows a, a, a much more flexible um, way of management um, that, that you can deal with. So you can do everything remotely instead of having people to walk out to various campuses, especially large universities that might have multiple multiple campuses. It gives you that ability to monitor and manage things uh, with far more convenience. Again, obviously IoT in certain other areas like chemical plants, nuclear plants, even mines uh, can be very dirty and un unpleasant. You can monitor certain types of processes where you would not want to put a human 24-7. Uh, so you have that ability of, of remote monitoring. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate this talk, and I think it's a fantastic lead into the next next talk. Thank um, you. You just released a view. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Meyer, can you please just um, see if we can put on your slides? Okay. Um, okay, let me quickly introduce Dr. Meyer. Dr. Um, Dr. Meyer completed a BSc, Honours and MSc qualification with distinction at the University of Pretoria. She began a part-time studies for a PhD in, in computer science in 2015, also at the University of Pretoria, while working as a research and software developer in the Cyber Warfare Research Group. In 2009, um, she completed a PhD uh, uh, thesis in super time, I must say, and in focusing and identifying the authenticity of smartphone data. Currently, she's working forward becoming an established cybersecurity specialist with the Information Cyber and Security Center, the CSR, um, that is a sister group of, of us in the building next to us. Well, although very, no, sorry, you moved to another building other side of the other side of the mountain. Uh, interest include digital forensic, mobile device security, and cybersecurity. And um, I think this talk follows fantastic on um, Dr. Van Niekerk's talk. It's about uh, lost packet warehouse service, about IoT devices you being used to get other information. So thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Van Heerden, for the warm welcoming. And thank you for the opportunity today to present the lost packet warehousing service. So perhaps just quickly, uh, just a quick overview of the contents of this presentation. So we'll do a quick introduction, just give a bit of an overview on motivation for this particular technology, some insights that can be provided by this technology, and then we'll conclude. So in terms of introduction, I think um, all of us will be aware that um, South Africa, especially the last two or three years, have seen significant uh, cyber attacks affecting organization companies uh, within the country. Um, if we look at uh, in October 2019, um, there was basically on a single day two attacks, one uh, targeting our uh, a bank, the, the banking sector um, with a denial of service attack, but it was also the city of Johannesburg that suffered a, a, a breach of their systems. So two significant attacks on a single day um, that really raised um, and caught the attention of a lot of people within the country. But stepping into uh, June of 2020 with the arrival, unfortunately, of the COVID pa pandemic, Hackers mindset sort of shifted, looking towards perhaps the health sector. And we saw that there was an attack at the Life Healthcare Group um, that was um, also caused some significant disruptions to their IT systems. 
but it didn't end there. And just a few months later, we heard about the Experian hack, um, the credit bureau company, that caused the exposure of approximately 24 million uh, personal details of South Africans. And what was interesting, um, as far as I recall, this attack, even though it was acknowledged and disclosed in August, it happened quite a, a while back, about a month or so, where uh, a fraudulent uh, transaction took place um, that led to the exposure of this information. And then, unfortunately, stepping into 2021, um, in July, we saw Transnet shortly after um, the severe um, civil unrest and protests that took place in our country. Transnet also suffered some disruptions of their IT systems that caused significant backlog at the ports. And then in September, it was the, the Justice Department that um, struggled for, for quite a few weeks to, to, to contain a ransomware attack. Um, and these kinds of attacks are, are not subsiding. They're increasing, especially in severity. Uh, we see with ransomware attacks, there has been a significant uptake in the country. Um, for those that might be interested, um, we have done a study looking at the past decade of cyber attacks within South Africa. That article hopefully will be uh, published by the end of this year. So for more insight into these attacks, please look out for that article. Um, it's quite quite interesting, um, in the findings that we discovered. And this is the motivation for this technology. There's a lot of attacks going on, but we don't have insight into these attacks. We don't have the necessary access to the data um, to do the necessary analysis to learn why did this attack take place, or took place rather, and also how can we prevent or even detect them perhaps early on? And this, this is exactly the motivation for the lost packet warehousing service. So we're trying to establish a technological, techno, tech, technological solution, apologies, with a South African focus to enable the passive but continuous collection of cybersecurity data. And with these data sets, we will be able to not only identify but also detect emerging trends in cyber attacks that hopefully we can make use of to better protect South Africa as a whole. So currently with the service, what we have is we're looking at the, the deployment of various sensors to enable the collection of these cybersecurity data. So we have collaborating quite close with the SAN Ring. Um, who's providing us the necessary support and infrastructure to deploy various sensors. We're looking at NetFlow um, collectors. We have deployed honeypots, as well as um, access to a network telescope. But we're also looking into open source information that's available. Um, we've developed various retrievers that can gather these um, open source information data sets for us that can also be used to enrich the, the findings of our more technical data collectors that are deployed on the SAN network. And then hopefully with all of this data collected, what we're trying to achieve is to see, okay, we have access to the raw data um, sets, hopefully that can be shared with interested parties. We're looking into visualizing the data to see what we can learn from them, doing automated reports, and then most critically is to monitor for those cyber attacks. So the offerings that we are envisage for this specific technology is firstly, like I've mentioned, the provider of raw data sets, which I think is quite critical. We need access to these data sets that's collected over quite a long period of time to, to better understand the attacks. How do they to, uh, take place? How do they infiltrate perhaps more specifically companies, organizations within South Africa? to enable us to provide the necessary insight to better defend against these cyber attacks. What's also uh, quite beneficial of collecting these more raw data sets is that we can make them available to universities, providing them or 
offering them to students to do perhaps further analysis to um, on these data sets to enable the development of better detection techniques on these cyber attacks. But we also would like Besides just looking at the raw data, we also want to do data analysis to, um, to provide insight to our close um, collaborators on this project. So processing of these raw data sets, visualizing, and then hopefully from, the, from these sites, we can learn attack behavior, attack patterns, and also perhaps commonly targeted weaknesses within certain organizations or environments. And then also, contribute perhaps just general cybersecurity research. Um, so one of the, as I've mentioned, one of the deliverables stemming from this project is just looking into South Africa um, cyber uh, security threat landscape. There's quite a limited view into this um, landscape from a South African perspective. And with this technology, we're sort of opening up and learning more what's happening from a cyber uh, perspective within our country. And then our more blue sky uh, ideal um, offering that we're looking to provide with this technology is what we termed the HoneyNet kit. And this is more a custom developed but a modular deployment of the service as a whole. So it offers um, you the necessary data sensors to do the, the collection of the data, but it will also incorporate the analysis and visualization of the data collected. And this is hopefully to provide this kind of solution, not only on a, a more uh, national level like the SAN Red Network, but also perhaps smaller organization um, companies like your SMMEs, that they can also have access to this kind of service within their own environment. And I will talk a bit more about the HoneyNet Kit later in the presentation. So just a bit of insights into the technology, what we've learned with our data collection and what we hope to achieve as well. So as I've mentioned, we have deployed uh, various sensors. We have honeypots, specifically Kauri, which is uh, SSH uh, medium interaction honeypot, and the ADB honey, which basically simulates an Android uh, mobile device, which has been deployed on the Sunray network. We're also collaborating with um, Tenet in terms of accessing data collected by the deployed network telescope. And then also, once again, um, due to the collaboration with Sunren, we also have access to the Net, NetFlow data feed, but it's dependent on making sure the data that we do collect there is normalized accurately. These sensors have been deployed on these various networks since the start of this financial year. So we've been able to collect quite a large data set, um, which we need to start investigating and see what we can learn from it. We did a bit of analysis focusing on more on our honeypot specifically, um, where we've developed automated reporting tools just to give us that sort of first level insight into what was collected by the, the, the honeypots, um, what kind of activity did take place on uh, these um, specific network environments. And we're also working towards a more dashboard kind of um, visualization structure, just to provide a more almost near real time insights into this um, data collection. So like I've mentioned, we have our Calorie Honeypot that collected some data between um, the start of the financial year, actually up until um, I think we only uh, paused the honeypot in uh, the end of this pre of the previous month. But just for the purposes of this presentation, I just looked at uh, the month of April, the 1st to the 20th, just to see what was basically collected by the honeypot, um, if there was any interesting findings. Um, it was interesting to see in terms of from a, a more worldwide scale, in terms of the IP addresses recorded by our honeypot, where were the locations where the attacks basically originated from? So on the, the map currently shown is all the unique IP address locations, so where all the attacks came from. And it's quite interesting to see that quite a large collection of IP addresses originated from China. It's also um, 
there's also quite a lot from the United States and even Europe as well. But what's not shown on the uh, presentation here, what was interesting for me to see is that even though uh, from a, un a unique IP address perspective, they're quite scattered across the globe. But the most prevalent, prevalent IP addresses actually originated from Russia, uh, which was quite interesting. Looking at um, the graph shown, Russia doesn't feature that much in terms of the the, the, the quantity of IP addresses uh, detected in the country, but it seems like from a prevalence point of view, this is perhaps the country that seems to be the most active when targeting these kinds of services. Also interesting was just to see in terms of the, the username and password combinations that we use to try to gain access to a honeypot. I think root and admin, as one can see there, it's, it's the, the most used combination. And that's sort of expected um, even so, with root 12345, 1234. But what was interesting to see was the combinations of Pi and Raspberry, Postgres, Oracle. And it sort of offers a bit of insight on the kind of services that these attackers were trying to um, or hopefully trying to gain access to what the kind of services they were trying to target. So it, it, it gives us a bit of insight and hopefully over time one can see if this perhaps changes. Um, I can say, obviously with your Raspberry Pi's we've seen in the, uh, also in the previous um, presentation, it's quite often used from internet or things perspective. So there's quite a lot of emphasis to try to gain access to these devices we need to change our default settings on them. And then also um, looking from the commands executed, so one act, once access was gained to the, um, the vulnerable service, the honeypot, what were the attackers trying to learn from the service? And if we look at the commands here, it's, it's more trying just to, to learn more what the machine can offer, um, how, what kind of infrastructure does the machine provide? Hopefully also perhaps trying to see or well, deduce is this perhaps a honeypot? Um, and then a bit lower on the graph, we can see that there was some download attempts, perhaps trying to get some malware onto the machine, um, making some transfers, secure copy of perhaps some malicious files, and then also executing some bash commands as well. And then perhaps just to, to touch again on our HoneyNet kit, as I've mentioned previously, um, this is sort of our custom developed more modular offering of the lost packet warehousing service, where we one can see we did develop a prototype of this, ironically making use of Raspberry Pis. We need to look at those credentials, um, where we have basically sort of two se segmentations, one more responsible for the management of our deployed sensors, as well as doing um, more threat intelligence and data enrichment activities. And then we have our deployed sensors. I've mentioned the ADB Honey and Cowrie, but we're also working with some of our fellow researchers in our center that developed a, a very stealthy port scan detector technology that we've also tested the possibility to deploy it as one of our sensors um, within this HoneyNet kit. And then we're also working towards perhaps adding additional sensors, uh, uh, also perhaps establishing a, a, a network telescope in this um, sort of isolated, isolated environment. So just some illustrations of the prototype. This is still a work in progress, but I've, uh, we have investigated uh, and had some discussions with interested parties. And this is, there seems to be real value interested in such a deployment of this technology. Um, we do hope that we can continue working on this in the next financial year to finalize this prototype development and hopefully taking, take it a bit further going forward. So perhaps just to conclude, 
The development and deployment of the lost uh, packet warehousing service, it's following a phased approach. We actually started working on this uh, technology about two years ago, and we're taking a little bit of baby steps towards um, finalizing this technology, but we're getting there. Um, I think we've shown already a lot of value by this, analyzing the data collected by the deployed sensors, and I believe the HoneyNet kit will really bring value, especially to our smaller um, companies, SMMEs within the country, to provide them also with a cybersecurity solution to monitor the, uh, their own environments. It's currently being developed by a research team at the CSOR. Um, we are located in the Information and Cybersecurity Center, but we are also working closely with the Sunring team. Um, to develop this uh, to develop this technology and in future work um, as I've mentioned it's a phased approach but we're working on to continue data collection analysis and then also developing the honeynet kit perhaps then also just a few acknowledgement this technology and the work we're doing will not be possible without the assistance from Sunrain, Nikis and Tenet um, providing us necessary in infrastructure to host these services, the census as well. Um, we really want to thank them for their um, assistance. And then also Mr. Ivan Burr for his technical contributions on, on the project. Um, it's really his um, sort of, um, I want to call it his brainchild, but it's his idea. He was the initiator and I hope we can take it forward and make a success of this project. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jumaya. Um, it's amazing for me, these two talks, how, uh, how good they fit. So the first question is, um, are you maybe optimized to be able to detect um, IoT type of, of attacks? I must admit, looking at the previous presentation, I'm so glad I attended the presentation. I think when we started with this project, we didn't really think so much from an IoT perspective. Um, and it was more attacks, more on a general network uh, environment. But looking at the increase in IoT attacks, I think we sort of need to emphasize the need to perhaps deploy sensors that can gather the necessary cyber security data to detect attacks that affect IoT devices. Um, there seems to be an opening for that, and I think we can perhaps address that going forward with this technology. Well, then we achieved a lot. So um, I think you can get, get uh, uh, Dr. Van Nikak's uh, contact details, <laughs> maybe contact him directly to start working together. Um, the the second the second question is um, I don't know if that information is available, but what are the cost of these um, small devices or the network the honey pots or so forth? So uh, the honey pots, I mean the 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 software itself is open source, so there's no cost involved. Um, the the infrastructure required to deploy them, there will probably be some cost involved, but they're not, they do not require such high resources to deploy. Um, for example, one can acquire a Raspberry Pi, and I think they, they, there's versions that are a bit more cheaper these days that you can use to deploy these honeypots. So the cost involved, not too expensive. It depends on the scale that you want to collect the data, I must say. So, um, what is it a problem if your device is at the side of a firewall to get the, the login information that you logged out, or do you have, or can you simply do it through web? What what's the solution to that? I think from a firewall perspective, um, you just need to give the net, or at least open the necessary ports to allow for the flow of that communication. We have deployed. Um, uh, prior to deploying on this um, SA Enri network, we deployed on local cloud services within South Africa for a month or so, just to, to test the sensors. And it was able to collect the data uh, without any concerns or any problems. So um, there's, I don't think, any real limitations, to be honest. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk, and all the luck with further research and development of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. And and hereby we end the SI Enrin track. Uh, please attend the security track um, hosted by Mishak next. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>